Hello everybody, my name is Bobby Rawl and today we're going to be talking about human factors in aviation. Our goal today is that you, the student pilot, understand personal health, flight physiology, aeromedical, and human factors. They can then apply that knowledge, manage associated risks, and demonstrate appropriate skills. Basically, today we're going to talk about the human body in relation to flying. Let's start first with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs describes the basic human needs. There's five layers. The first layer is physiological needs. So that's air, water, food, shelter, sleep, and sex. The next layer is safety and security. So that's the feeling of, okay, nothing bad's going to happen to me in my day-to-day -day life. Next is love and belongingness. This is one of the things that we're responsible for as instructors, is instilling uh, in you, the student pilot, a sense of belongingness. If you don't feel like you belong, you won't succeed as a pilot. You'll constantly feel like an outsider and you won't be able to, to grow. Next is self-esteem. you got to really... You gotta believe that you're gonna succeed. And that could be at anything, at school, aviation, sports, art, whatever your your thing is, you have to have a belief in order to achieve. And what are we trying to achieve? Self-actualization, that's at the top there. Self-actualization is achieving who you wanna become, achieving your goals, who you, achieving your full potential basically is what that means. All right, let's talk about risk management with human factors. So let's start with the I'm safe checklist. You've probably seen this before in your flight training. I'm safe checklist stands for illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and emotion. These are things that you need to be aware of physically when you fly. So illness, don't fly when you're sick. Next, medication. Are you taking a medication that could compromise uh, your physical well-being? That could be as simple as taking a Benadryl when you're sick. Taking a Benadryl has drowsy properties. It makes you sleepy, and you have to be off uh, that medication for a certain amount of time before you go flying. That would be an example of a medication you need to be aware of. Next is stress. Are you stressed out about this flight? For whatever reason, that could compromise your uh, ability as a pilot. Next is alcohol. There's no safe amount of alcohol that you can be under the influence of when you're flying an airplane. Next is fatigue. Don't fly tired, don't fly exhausted. You gotta come ready to do whatever that flight is. If that's a training flight, a cross country flight, you can't be fatigued to do it. Next is emotion. Emotionally, yourself, are you ready for that flight? Or did you have a grandparent die recently? Or are you having a hard time at home or at your job? That will affect your flying ability. And so you need to be honest with yourself and say, okay, am I emotionally up for this flight? Yes or no. So that's the I'm safe checklist. Let's move over to the PAVE checklist. PAVE checklist stands for Pilot, Aircraft, Environment, and External Pressures. Let's start with Pilot. So Pilot refers to our I am safe checklist, so that's our physical well-being, but then also our legal uh, responsibilities. So are you legal to fly today? That could be, do you have the correct license? Are you endorsed for this plane? That is what they mean when they say Pilot in the PAVE checklist. Next is Aircraft. Is our aircraft legal and safe to fly in today? Do we meet the weight and balance? Do we have our aero and AVA documents? Consider the aircraft when you go through the PAVE checklist. Next is our environment. Are we putting ourselves in a poor environment here? Are we flying in weather beyond our personal minimums? Are we flying to an airport that might be beyond our skill level? Consider the environment before you go flying. Next is external pressures. Are you feeling pressure to do this flight? So you have to be aware of those external pressures, whether it's passengers or you're trying to go on vacation. Be aware of it. Do not let that affect your go, no-go decision. Next, let's talk about stress. Stress is your body's reaction to demands placed on it. We've all experienced stress before. There are two kinds of stress, acute and chronic. Acute is a one-time sort of event, and chronic is long-term. So think acute stress, one-time stress, or chronic long-term stress. It's important to know what our body's uh, stress threshold is. What is the stress threshold? That's when our body goes from reacting normally to stress to reacting abnormally to stress. Every person's is different. It's important to be aware of your own personal limits so you don't overstress yourself. Next is fatigue. Again, like stress, there are two types, acute and chronic. Fatigue usually results from a lack of sleep, 
a lot of exercise or a lot of work. And work could be at your job, but it could also be studying for a pilot test. If you fly fatigued, you are increasing your chance of pilot error. That's why it's included in the I'm safe checklist. If you're fatigued, don't fly. Next is nutrition and hydration. You'd be surprised how many flight students come to flight lessons and they haven't eaten all day or they haven't drank water. Uh, skipping meals will inhibit your performance as a pilot. It's really important that you come well fed. You also have to maintain proper hydration. If you're not hydrated, you risk uh, heat exhaustion or even heat stroke. You can't learn anything if you're thirsty. Same thing if you're hungry. You're not going to learn anything if you're hungry. So for me, my personal minimums is that I always carry a bottle of water and a snack. In, in my case, my snack is a protein bar. That way I'm always making sure during my flight I'm hydrated and I, if I get hungry during the flight, I have a snack I can eat. Next, let's talk about drugs. No person may operate as a crew member under the influence of any drug that inhibits a person's faculty in any way contrary to safety. Any illicit drug is strictly prohibited by the FAA. Drugs and piloting do not go together. That is a red line that the FAA makes clear and you should make that clear with yourself. Let's talk about medication. Medication does fall under the drugs category. It's important to know that you're responsible for never flying under the influence of medication not approved by the FAA. I'll leave a link below to FAA approved medications. They have a really nice guide that gives you sort of an answer for, especially for over-the-counter medic medications, whether you're safe to fly with that or if you're not. Next is alcohol. No person may operate as a crew member under the influence of alcohol. There's no safe amount of alcohol when flying. The legal limit is eight hours bottled to throttle. What does that mean? You can't have a drink within eight hours of when you're going to act as pilot in command or as a required crew member. Or your blood alcohol limit has to be below 0.04% and you cannot be under the influence of alcohol. I would set per higher personal minimums than this. Next, let's talk about hazardous attitudes. Hazardous attitudes are attitudes that pilots uh, may display or they might encounter in other pilots. These are the five most common ones. We have anti-authority, impulsivity, invulnerability, macho, and resignation. It's important to be able to identify these attitudes in yourself and in other pilots and be able to apply the correct antidote. So if you're experiencing anti-authority uh, attitudes, if you recognize that in yourself or in others, make sure you follow a strict adherence to the rules. Those will keep you safe and they're usually right. If you are feeling impulsive, if you're feeling stress, slow it down, think before you act. Invulnerable. If you think something bad won't happen or the risk you feel like is low, you have to remind yourself that it could happen to you. There's a reason why these things are considered risks and hazards. Next is macho. I can do it. Doing something either that you have no training for or you're undertrained for or you've never done it before, don't take any unnecessary chances while flying an airplane. Taking chances like that is foolish. Next is resignation. That's sort of the attitude when of just giving up. You are a highly trained pilot with a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge. You're not helpless in the plane. You know how to fly the plane. Just remember, aviate, navigate, communicate. Next, let's talk about hypoxia. Hypoxia is a condition in which there is a deficiency of oxygen delivered at the tissue level. Your body doesn't, is not getting enough oxygen. That's hypoxia. There's a lot of different causes. The most common cause is altitude. You fly up to a higher altitude and there's not enough oxygen for your body. How do you know if you're experiencing hypoxia? You'll have blue fingernails and blue lips, a sign of lack of oxygen. Your judgment will be impaired. You'll experience lightheadedness, tingling and at the most severe level, you may pass out. Everybody's hypoxia symptoms are different. If you see somebody acting weird that you're flying with, or you notice yourself acting weird, and you're like, wow, I've been at you know, 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet, 15,000 feet for 10, 20, 30 minutes, whatever, get to a lower altitude immediately. That's your first sign of, hey, something's not right here. There are four types of hypoxia. Uh, there's hypoxic hypoxia. This is the most common form of hypoxia. That's when you're at a very high altitude. Next is hypemic hypoxia. This is a type of hypoxia caused by uh, your blood is unable to carry oxygen. Next is stagnant hypoxia. This type of hypoxia happens at the circulatory level. If your blood flow is compromised for any reason, 
then sufficient oxygen cannot get to the body tissues. Next is histotoxic. This type of hypoxia happens at the cell level. Cell level. This means that the cell expecting and needing the oxygen is impaired and cannot use oxygen to support metabolism. These, this is a basic overview of hypoxia. I'll leave a link below to an FAA guide on hypoxia that goes into much, much more detail on hypoxia. You can talk about hypoxia for hours. Because of the risk of hypoxia, we have oxygen requirements. You are required to have supplemental oxygen for yourself, for your crew, and for passengers at certain altitudes. From 12,500 feet MSL to 14,000 feet MSL, crew must have supplemental oxygen after 30 minutes of flight. So if you plan on flying to that altitude for more than 30 minutes, you must have uh, supplemental oxygen for yourself. And if you're flying with another pilot or flight attendant, you need to have oxygen for that. 14,000 feet MSL and above, you must use uh, supplemental oxygen the entire time. So that would be for yourself, the crew, etc. At 15,000 feet MSL and above, every oc occupant must be provided with supplemental oxygen. So you as a pilot are required, your second in command or your safety pilot will be required to have it, but, and you must be, you must provide it to the passengers. If you're flying with passengers, they're not required to take it. Next is carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas that is produced by all engines. Carbon monoxide prevents oxygen from being carried to the cells. That's our hypemic hypoxia. Carbon monoxide poisoning will happen if, most commonly, if your exhaust has a leak and it's leaking directly into the, the cabin. You'll know you're experiencing it when you have nausea, nausea dizziness, headache, weakness, and if it, happen, if it lasts long enough in that con condition, you could pass out. The cure, how do we treat for it while we're flying? Crack those windows open, get the air going, and land immediately. It's very, very dangerous and can be deadly. So it's really important that if you think you're experiencing carbon monoxide poisoning, get those windows open, get those vents open, land immediately, and then go to a hospital if it's really severe or go to your doctor as soon as possible. Don't fly until you've gotten checked out by a doctor if you think you've experience carbon monoxide poisoning. Next is hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is when you're breathing too much. You're not getting enough CO2 into your body. Hyperventilation can happen to anybody at any time. It's important to know that, hey, if I'm breathing too much, I might cause myself to pass out. So if you feel yourself breathing too fast, slow down your breathing to your no normal rate. Next is hy hypothermia. I live in Minnesota. Hypothermia is definitely a real risk, especially in our tiny little Cessna 152s. Hypothermia degrades your physiological and cognitive abilities. If you've never been in like serious, serious cold, it might be kind of hard to imagine. But like when it gets down peak winter in January, December, February, um, and you try to control like your fingertips get really, really cold. So it's important to know what you have at your disposal. In our 152s, we have a cabin heat. But most importantly, to avoid hypothermia, just come prepared. For me, in the wintertime, I always carried gloves with me so my fingertips wouldn't get cold because you need your fingertips to fly. But then also I'd wear a winter jacket, long pants, I would have a hat. So come prepared for the cold. Next, let's talk about motion sickness. Motion sickness is caused by the brain receiving conflicting messages about the body. This is uh, a common thing that newer pilots might experience. If you're a new pilot and you're experiencing this, it's very, very normal. If you experience motion sickness in the flight, I was told by my instructor to look at the November number inside the plane. Just something steady and slow down your breathing, drink some water. All right, next let's talk about spatial disorientation. Spatial disorientation is the mistaken perception of one's position and motion relative to the earth. As a VFR pilot, hopefully you won't experience this, but I, as an instructor, I like to give students the experience of flying into actual uh, IMC uh, conditions. The reason is, is because you'll experience spatial disorientation. You have no reference to the earth. How do you know you're left from your right? You're up from your down. Spatial disorientation causes these illusions. We have There's a, uh, eight of them. The easy way to remember them is the term ice flags. Ice flag stands for inversion illusion, Coriolis illusion, elevator illusion, false horizon, the leans, autokinesis, 
graveyard spile, and somatographic illusion. I'm not going to get into all these today. It's important to know that these are your spatial disorientation illusions. How do we cure spatial disorientation? What's our treatment for it in the plane? Follow your instruments. Your instruments will give you the information you need to tell you if you're level, if you're in a bank, if you're descending. You got to have a really strong instrument scan. Next, let's talk about optical illusions. There are some optical illusions you may face uh, while flying uh, VFR. Optical illusions, the most common ones that we have here are runway width illusion, runway slope illusion, haze, fog, water refraction, featureless terrain illusion, and ground light illusion. The featureless terrain and ground light illusions, we'll talk about those when we talk about night operations. I'll focus on the top three here today. So the runway width illusion. When you're practicing landing, your instructor will most likely have you focus on one or two similar runways, like the airports that you practice at, or runways. If you go to a different airport, let's say a big international airport, and they have this giant wide runway that's super long, it may cause runway width illusion where you feel like you are uh, closer to the ground than you actually are. And so on that approach, you'll level out, you'll, you'll flare maybe higher than when you're actually supposed to because the runway is so wide. It's the same on the inverse if, if you're landing on a narrower runway than what you're used to. Because you might think, okay, I'm used to this with a runway, but if it's a narrower runway, it'll appear smaller. And so you think you'll have to keep descending in order to hit that runway. That goes back to our NW craft, preparing for our runways. Are we gonna have a narrow runway, a wide runway? You have to be able to prepare yourself for that. Another thing to prepare yourself when you think about runways is our runway slope illusion. If your runway is a downsloping runway or an upsloping runway, it may cause you to fly an unstable, unsafe approach, either rounding out too high or too low. It's important to be aware if your runway has a slope or not. Next, let's talk about uh, haze, fog, and water refraction. Basically, any water suspended in the atmosphere, be that rain, haze, fog, whatever. That, that'll, if you've ever flown through it, I recommend it. It's a good experience. Do it with an instructor, obviously, be safe. But basically what, what that makes it feel like is everything becomes a little bit more blurry. It can be very difficult, and so you need to be aware that, okay, uh, the runway may appear closer or further away, depending on the runway. And so you need to be aware that of the effect that water on your windscreen or haze has on your ability to judge distances. Next, I'll talk about middle ear and sinus problems. If you are, this goes back to I'm safe. Are you experiencing a cold? A common cold that people face is a sinus or a middle ear issue. Basically what the issue is, is that the gas in your sinus and your ears needs to expand and escape. The problem is, is that when you're having a middle ear or sinus problem, the gas can't escape. And so it can be very painful. Don't fly if you have a cold. It's an unnecessary risk because you might start hurting during the flight and you can't learn anything that way. Last thing that we'll talk about is scuba diving. You might think scuba diving, what effect will that have? When you're scuba diving, you could experience something called decompression sickness or the bends. Basically what it is, is as you travel deep underwater, nitrogen travels under high pressure from the lungs to the blood. As the nitrogen is in your blood, if you climb up to an altitude too fast, that nitrogen is unable to leave your blood causing the formation of bubbles. The bubbles is that decompression sickness or the bends. If you get up high at quickly in altitude too quickly, uh, that could be a very painful thing. So we have a couple regulations against scuba diving and flying. So 12 hours between scuba diving and flights up to 8,000 feet MSL. So if you're gonna do a casual flight, uh, flight lesson, you must have at least 12 hours separation between that flight lesson and that scuba diving event. If you're gonna fly above 8,000 feet MSL, you must leave at least 24 hours between that scuba diving event and that flight above 8,000 feet MSL. And that's all I got for you today. If you have any more questions or you wanna dig deeper further into these subjects, I'm gonna leave a link below to the PHAC where I got this information, the FAA Flying Handbook, and any guides that I found helpful throughout my piloting career. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please leave it down below.